Good morning. I'm Linda Thomas. I'm a, a pediatric radiologist here at Wilford Hall, and I was just going to talk about ultrasound of the pediatric hip and spine. Um, and just so you know, the uh, handouts that you got are uh, the wrong version of this lecture. I messed up. Um, so it is different and incomplete. But uh, if you want, um, you can. I can always give you a, a copy of the this lecture I'm giving today. So I was just going to talk about um, technique of hip and spine ultrasound in babies and common indications. Um, one thing, if you're doing an ultrasound in a young infant, um, something to keep in mind is to have a warm room, have them either recently fed or they can feed during the examination, and sometimes they'll just you know, sleep through the whole thing, and it just makes it easier on everybody. Of course, that doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not the same case for like an 18-month-old who will you know, just depending on their disposition, may cooperate or may scream and fight you through the whole examination. But the ultrasounds I'm going to talk about today are mostly done on, on young infants. So the first thing um, that I'm going to talk about is the most common reason that uh, I do hip ultrasound, and that's for DDH, or developmental dysplasia of the hip, also previously known as congenital hip dislocation or congenital um, hip dysplasia. And the gist is is that there's abnormal position of the femoral head in relation to the acetabulum, and so both of them develop abnormally. Um, it's much more common in females than males and more common in uh, Caucasians than African Americans. There are several risk factors, and sometimes, uh, a lot of times, we'll just screen infants, not because they have an abnormal physical examination, but because they have a risk factor. Probably the most common risk factor I see is because they were breech presentation at the time of birth. Um, so family history is important, breech presentation, and then anything that limits uh, fetal motion, fetal, fetal positioning, may, um, might, might uh, result in prolonged abnormal position of the femoral head in relation to acetabulum in utero. So breech presentation, if there's fetal crowding, like an oligohydramnios, multiple gestations, low birth weight, and then similar um, club foot deformity is associated with EDH because it can also be from abnormal fetal positioning. On physical exam, the pediatrician may see asymmetric skin or gluteal folds, leg leg discrepancy. Um, they do their stress maneuvers, may have a palpable click or clunk. Um, and then if, say, it's an older child that hasn't had care, uh, a sign may be delayed amb ambulation or a limp in a toddler. Uh, the timing of exam, uh, optimally, I like to perform at about six weeks of age if there are risk factors. Um, if the hip is grossly abnormal, like when they're getting their newborn exam, I think it's fine to go ahead and, and do it as a newborn. I just like to wait about six weeks and kind of the mildly abnormal or if they just have risk factors because um, you'll get a lot of like physiologic immature hips and end up doing a lot of, uh, of follow-ups. Um, so I, if, if we can wait till six weeks, till they're more mature, kind of established, they're probably going to be normal, establish them as normal, they don't have to come back for another exam. So the um, method of ultrasound was developed by some orthopedic surgeons, Graf and Hark, and um, it's a modality of choice as opposed to plain film to use up to about four to five months of age. Um, and that's because the femoral head begins to ossify roughly about two to three months of age, and then it just progresses. So the more the femoral head is ossified, the more shadowing it causes, and then the worse your vis visualization of the acetabulum is. So um, sometimes I'll just try it, though, up to maybe about six months of age, um, and if, if you can't see anything, then you do the plain foam, but at least you've avoided the, the radiation. The um, two basic views are the coronal view and transverse view. And the coronal view looks at the morphology, the acetabular shape and position, and the relation of the femoral head to the acetabulum. And the transverse view just looks more at the um, stability of the femoral head with and without stress. So this is um, just an example of obtaining the coronal view. The infant is placed in the decubitus position, hip is flexed, and uh, transducer is held slightly ob oblique. So I'll show you an example of a normal anatomy. To our left is um, the ultrasound, and to the right is just a schematic, hopefully to kind of um, just help, help your mind with the anatomy. Um, for orientation, remember they're on their side, and the infant's head is to our left, the feet are to our right, and this, just follow my arrows, this is the, the iliac wing, and this is the ossified portion of the acetabulum here.
And I'm just uh, have arrows also coming up on the corresponding um, schematics. So again, just to help your your mind in in orientation on the image. This is the labrum, and then this is the cartilaginous femoral head. So it looks like cartilage anywhere else. You know, it's dark with little speckles in it. And then this is the cartilaginous um, greater trochanter. Just re as a reminder, in um, infants, it is attached to the, the cartilaginous femoral head, so they're attached, and then as they grow, they separate out into the, the adult anatomy. Um, so angle measurements uh, are done on the coronal view. Um, a baseline is drawn along the iliac, and then a second line drawn along the acetabular roof. That angle is called the alpha angle. And... Uh, it should be normal. Um, it should be 60 degrees or greater if normal. So if you um, think of this, this is kind of like the opposite angle to the acetabular angle we do on plane films, um, where you use a line uh, connecting the triradiate cartilage, and then you you measure the uh, angle of the acetabulum in relation to that. We're we're kind of looking at the same thing just in a different way. So the transverse view, the baby is in oblique position. You just turn your transducer 90 degrees uh, to the position in the coronal view, and the leg is flexed, and you can image it, image at rest and then with stress, and just gently push the femur uh, towards the hip. It's a posterior um, maneuver, and the amount of force is not, we don't, I don't, we don't use that great of force, um, and kind of roughly what you'd use to um, hang up the phone, so you don't want to, um, you know, force, use too much force. So this is normal anatomy on a transverse view. This is your cartilaginous femoral head. And here is um, ossified portion of the ischium. So on this view, we're not looking at the ili ilium at all. Um, this is the ossified portion of the pubic bone. And then this ossified portion of the uh, proximal femoral metaphysis. So kind of like the lateral hip gluteal region is the most superior aspect of the of the image. There is a grading system from normal to abnormal of hips. It's the graph system. I just um, put it put it in here just so you're aware of it. And then a schematic just to show that it goes from one normal to four, a frankly dislocated hip with, with a variety of findings in between. So graph um, type one is a normal hip. And this is, this is just coronal images showing the anatomy of, an, of what a normal hip would look like. So you draw your line um, down the iliac and just take a look at the amount of coverage of the uh, acetabulum. The amount the acetabulum covers the femur should be at least 50% or greater. Um, you look at the morphology of the acetabular rim, and it's nice and angular in a normal hip. The labrum is in normal position. This is the labrum. And the alpha angle is 60 degrees or greater. And then on your transverse imaging, you would um, you know, show that there is no dynamic instability. So that is by far um, the most common I see is that they're normal. Uh, the next most common hip that I see is a graph type 2A, also known as physiologic immaturity. And so this is just mildly abnormal, but it's a young child. They're they should be less than three months of age. So different um, contrast to this other case, the acetabularum is more rounded as opposed to nice and sharp on the the prior study, labrum is still in normal position, but your alpha angle is low. It's now between 50 and 59 degrees. And if you look um, at the femoral head in relation to a line drawn along the iliac, it's um, less than 50% covered but not displaced out of the acetabulum. And if they're young, we'll just repeat their scan in 68 weeks. Oftentimes, it's a normal at follow-up. If it isn't normal at follow-up, or we image them, say, after three months of age and we have the same findings, then they fall into an abnormal hepograph type 2B. So it's just the same findings, except that patients are greater than three months of age, and they would need orthopedic referral. And then um, there is a graph type 2C, which is very similar findings, except the alpha angle is even less. And um, they would just need orthopedic referral. And then uh, we're going on to graph type 3. So there's an A and a B. And A just is if the acetabular cartilage is normal in appearance, and B is if it's abnormally echogenic. 
So in this um, case, you can draw your line along the iliac, and you see that the femoral head is moderately displaced, definitely less than 50% covered. Um, the superior acetabularum is flattened. If you remember back to the other case, it was nice and sharp. And um, the alpha angle is low. It's less than 43 degrees. And the um, and just the differentiating feature, again, between graft type A and B is that, in this case, the acetabular roof cartilage is abnormally echogenic. So, and then a graft type 4 is just a, a frankly dislocated hip. A com the femoral head is completely displaced. And so you draw your line along the iliac, and you can see the femoral head is nowhere near the acetabulum. The acetabular uh, rim is flattened, alpha angle is low, and they would just require urgent referral. And this is just an example of bilateral uh, graft 4 hips, bilateral dislocated hips. So this is your iliac, your acetabulum, and here's your femoral head on both sides um, dislocated. So treatment varies from um, pavlocarnus, which uh, flexes, abducts, and externally rotates um, at the hips to keep the femoral head and acetabulum so that you can encourage normal development of both. Um, if that fails or if the um, hips are really abnormal, they, do, they can do surgical reduction in casting. And then especially in an older child that has failed um, therapy or that had a delay in diagnosis, they may, may need osteotomies of the um, acetabulum and or femur to reshape um, the, the hip joint and kind of get it, get it in place. So um, the next common reason I do hip ultrasound is to look for hip effusion. Um, similar to what Michael was talking about, I, the effusion is just done, I mean the ultrasound is just done to look for effusion of which there is a differential diagnosis. Of course the main thing that our referring providers worry about is septic arthritis, but it could be septic arthritis, toxic synovitis. You can see effusions in like calvary perthes. You can see them after trauma. Um, you can just see them in inflammatory arthritis. So there is a differential diagnosis of which ultrasound does not help. It just helps establish whether there is an effusion. So septic arthritis, um, you know, a child will present with painful joint, failure, bare weight, limp, fever, elevated inflammatory marker markers. Um, I, everybody gets nervous about it because a delay in diagnosis can lead to destruction of the hip joint. Um, it's usually monoarticular, can be in, involve any joint, but the hip would be most common. Um, so as I said, ultrasound is just used to identify the presence of hip effusion. And the technique, this is an anterior technique, just like um, what Michael was saying, and um, you go anterior the hip joint and look at the femoral neck head junction, of which in a child is partly cartilaginous. Um, I find it's helpful to image both sides. I don't use an absolute measurement. I look for asymmetry. So um, I'll show a couple cases, but there's I like I like a buddy shot with them right next to each other, and I find that most helpful. Um, so you look for asymmetric widening of um, a, the joint space between the shaft of the proximal femur and the joint capsule. The fluid can be anywhere from hypoechoic, anechoic to hyperechoic. The, the character of the fluid, however, is not a predictor of the type of type of effusion. Um, it just indicates the presence of an effusion. So this uh, is a case that ended up being septic arthritis and just for orientation the patient's head is to our left and their feet are to our right and this is the um, proximal femoral metaphysis. This is the cartilaginous portion of the femoral head and that is the ossified portion of the femoral head. And when you look for an effusion, this is fluid in the anterior joint space distending the joint capsule, which is right here, away from the proximal femur. So you can imagine if you didn't image the femoral metaphysis or metadiaphyseal region and you were just imaging over the femoral head, and if you weren't used to looking at a pediatric hip, you might confuse the femoral head cartilage for an effusion, and so you gotta just remember to look look inferior more at the femoral neck. And so this is the control outside, which which I find helpful to look at, just to compare. And I then I have a buddy shot on the next image, but um, here is the uh, proximal femoral metadiaphysis that's ossified, and this is cartilaginous um, portion of the growth plate. Um, and here is the ossified portion of the femoral head, and there's the joint capsule closely opposed to the proximal femur. 
there's a joint capsule over the cartilaginous femoral head. And so this is just a, um, a comparison view, which I think nicely shows um, the hip effusion on the right, the symptomatic side. They did undergo a hip aspiration, and hip culture was positive for Klebsiella in this case. So toxic synovitis is probably the, as I said, there's a differential diagnosis. is probably the, the next most common thing that they think is going on. Um, it's usually children about 3 to 10 years of age present with joint pain and limp, but usually their symptoms are less severe than in septic arthritis. They may be afebrile, low-grade femur, fever. Um, it is more common in males than females. Um, and that it is it is more of a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, if they meet criteria for aspiration, they will get aspirated. Um, and as Michael uh, pointed out, there is different literature about criteria for used aspiration. What I've listed are just some that uh, that they use where I did fellowship, but it varies. But I'm sure by by practitioner and institution, and it's thought maybe to due to a viral infection. Um, so this is a case that uh, the child did undergo a hip aspirate that was negative, but I think it's just a nice example of, of showing the what an effusion looks like. Um, and you can see that this child is older than the, the earlier case because they have less, um, less of a cartilaginous growth plate and less of a cartilaginous femoral head. But here's the proximal uh, femoral metaphysis, and on the asymptomatic normal side, the patient right side, the joint capsules closely opposed to the proximal femur, whereas on the symptomatic side, you can see that it is displaced by the anechoic fluid. And so again, they did do a tap. It was uh, negative for bacterial growth. It only had a few white cells in it, so it was good. they were given a presumptive diagnosis of toxic synovitis. So next I was going to move on to spine ultrasound. And the main reason I do spine ultrasound is to look for occult spinal dysphagia, meaning um, skin covered. Dysraphism. So unlike myelomeningocele, which should be um, a not a skin covered and not a cult, it's usually very obvious. So and and by far the most common reason I do spine ultrasound is for sacral dimple, and most of the time they're very low dimples. You could almost call them coccygeal dimples. They're over the coccyx. And in that instance, the pretest probability of this study being positive is very low. They're more most commonly normal. But if they have higher abnormalities, higher skin manifestations like lower lumbar spine, like a lumbar hair patch, a lumbar vascular patch, or skin appendage, then it's, there's much higher likelihood this test is going to be positive. Um, and then we'll often also do ultrasound if they've got other congenital anomalies associated with tethered cord or called dysraphism, such as like imperforate anus. Um, timing, I think, is optimally performed about two weeks of age. And the reason uh, being is that in the immediate neonatal newborn period, in the first few days of life, they're relatively dehydrated. They don't have a lot of CSF. And so um, it's harder to kind of say that, that the spinal cord is really lying in a dependent position because you don't have the CSF dorsal to the cord to say that. And also I look for normal motion, normal pulsation of the uh, cord and, root, and roots, and um, it's harder to see that without a lot of CSF. So I like to wait for two weeks of age, and often we can coordinate it with their two-week well baby exam so that they can just make one trip in and get it all done on the same day. And um, you don't want to do it too late, though, in infancy because there's progressive ossification of the spinous processes, and that just causes more and more shadowing and poor visualization of the spinal canal. So what we're, we're looking for, looking through is um, the cartilaginous spinous processes that, that allow us to see the spinal canal. And as those ossify, it just gets harder. So it's probably not useful after four to six months of age. Um, we do try it, and sometimes we can at least say conus is normal. Can't say anything else, but conus is normal. If that, if that helps them feel better about tethering or not, um, then, then we may just stop there. Um, positioning, it's done prone. You can put a bolster under the abdomen to reduce the lumbar lordosis. And just like any ultrasound in an infant, it's helpful to have a nice warm room, keep them warm, maybe feed them during the examination or have them recently fed so they can, um, you know, just be comfortable throughout the study. And then image and longitudinal and transverse planes. 
So a key is accurate numbering of the vertebral bodies. Um, and so you count from below and above. So identify the sacral elements, count from below, and then also um, identify the last ribs and count from above. So it does get a little bit more confusing if they have transitional anatomy. If that is the case, um, sometimes, no matter how you count, the conus is in the normal position. And so if it is, regardless of how I count, I may just stop there, but if, if I'm confused, you can do plain film and kind of correlate what is what really is their anatomy um, on plain film. You can also mark um, what, what level like you think T12 is or L5 with a radiopaque marker and do plain film and kind of correlate plain film and ultrasound with that. So determine the level of the conus and evaluate the morphology. It should taper normally. If it's not tapering normally, you have to worry about um, abnormalities like caudal regression syndrome where it's abnormally blunted. And um, the normal position for an infant should be at the L2, L3 disc space or above. Um, but a caveat is in preterm infants, it may be as low as L3. And in those instances, it's helpful to do follow-ups just to make sure it's normal when they're term or older. Um, you look for normal motion, kind of normal the pulsation. Cord should lie dependently in the spinal canal. And then on your transverse images, you can look for dysraphic defects of the lumbar um, po posterior elements. So it's just, mo you know, a, f a large part of the posterior elements be cartilage, but you look just the same way you would look on a prenatal ultrasound. You look for splaying of the posterior elements. Um, so this is a normal longitudinal image, and, and this image is nice in that it includes the um, uh, lower spinal cord as well. The baby's on their stomach, so the vertebral bodies are at the inferior aspect of our image, and T12 and L1 are labeled. And then you can see the spinous processes of which they're partially ossified along the uh, superior aspect of our image. The head, infant's head is to our left, their feet are to our right. Um, so the spinal cord, you can see it in the uh, central aspect of the spinal canal, and the conus um, medullaris, it tapers normally, and you can see the surrounding uh, nerve roots of the distal spinal cord and conus medullaris and the cauda equina, and then the CSF lying dorsally. So this is a normal um, transverse image. So again, the child's on their stomach, vertebral body is anteriorly labeled by a V. Um, you can see the spinal cord in the central aspect of the spinal canal, and I think this transverse image shows nicely that it's laying dependently. You can see CSF dorsal to the spinal cord, um, and then the little arrowhead just is pointing to ossified portion of um, the transverse process. And you can see the dorsal nerve roots and the ventral nerve roots. So this is just a normal variant. It's a, a filar cyst, and, um, and it shouldn't be confused with something that's abnormal. Um, I mentioned them in my report and just say it's a normal variant, and, and, and then you can be done with it. So um, the arrowhead is just pointing to the uh, central spinal canal, but you can see the conus medullaris tapers normally. It terminates at the level of the inferior L1 vertebral body, and then distal to that in the proximal aspect of the phylum is this elliptical um, anechoic cyst, very characteristic of a, a phylar cyst. The other thing is it shouldn't be confused for is um, abnormal elongation or a low position, abnormal elongation of the quarter or abnormally low position of the um, fi of the conus. If you say had an ossified spinous process in between these two, you could see that the shadowing might um, might make it seem that this is actually the the um, determination of the conus. So you can also get positional pseudomasses as, as a normal variant and just shouldn't be confused with something that's abnormal. If the baby is squirmy and kind of rotating, um, small changes in, in infant position can result in larger changes in imaging. I find that all the time on plain film as well as ultrasound. And so the, the nerve roots can rotate to the side that's down and, and look like a mass. And it's helpful just um, to get uh, reposition them and show that they're normal. And in this case, um, I can't remember how to get rid of the lines I draw on, on there. Do you know, Arnold? Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, um, but on the launch tool, you can see that the, the nerves are normal on this one. So let's look at some abnormal cases. Um, I have ultrasound and then MRI correlates. 
So this is a two-day-old who had multiple congenital anomalies and was referred for sp uh, spine ultrasound. And I think these, uh, all the cases I have to show are young infants, meaning we didn't wait till two weeks, and that was just determined because they they really had a high pretest probability of, of being abnormal. Um, so two-day-old with multiple congenital anomalies. In uh, the ultrasound, we're looking from L2 to L5. They're prone, so the, the head is to our left and the feet are to our right. The, um, the spinal cord is actually abnormally elongated, and it's really, I think, hard to tell on ultrasound where cord ends and where conus begins, but it's all low in position, so it's abnormal. And then it's also hard to tell where conus is and where phylum begins because it's all thickened with this echogenic material. And everywhere else in the body except the breast, I think fat is most of the time echogenic. And so this is, this is a good look for a lipoma confirmed at MRI. This is a sagittal T1 weighted image of the uh, lumbar spine. And uh, when we're looking for tethered cord or anything on our MRI, we have a specific tethered cord protocol. And I just mentioned it here so that if you're doing it, the tethered cord protocol, the fields open up so that you include the whole sacrum down to the coccyx. Um, because um, unlike our routine lumbar spines in adults, they usually cut off part of the sacrum. But in a tethered cord, you want to see the whole sacrum, especially if they have sacral anomalies or elongated, a fetal elongation of the cord low conus, look for, um, you know, sacral lipomas um, and low and low dysrhythmic defects. So this just, uh, the MRI confirms that there is, there's fetal elongation of the cord low I think it's hard to even find the conus, but it's it's all low in position, and then there's a kind of a large phylar lipoma of um, lipoma of the phylum terminale or phylar lipoma. And then this is a one week old who had imperforate anus and scoliosis. So again, kind of a high higher likelihood that the test is going to be positive. And um, this is a longitudinal image, ultrasound image of the spine, and we're at the level of L1, L2, and superior aspect of L3. And you can see that the um, spinal cord is in the um, middle of the spinal canal, and there's distension of the central spinal canal that looks like a syrinx, and this is confirmed on our MRI. So they have a sagittal T2-weighted image of the lumbar spine. And um, this, the conus is really low. It's down by S1, uh, S2 disc space, is marked by the arrowhead, and then the um, arrow points to the, the large syrinx in the, in the distal spinal cord. So they have a tethered cord and syrinx. And then this is an example of a lipomyelomeningocele, one day old with soft tissue swelling on the lower back. So in this case, it was a very kind of clinically obvious fatty mass of the lower back. But lipomyelomeningoceles, because it's a, a skin cover defect, can just, uh, they can be subtle on physical examination and just have like a little back fat. So occasionally you'll see this um, come up later in life, especially if they don't have a lot of symptoms. Um, related to it. But a lipomyelomeningocele, uh, this child I'm having a lipomyelomeningocele. So the ultrasound images are uh, on our left, and the head again is to our left, the feet are to our right. And the image at the top of the screen is higher up at the level of L L2, L3, L4, and then the um, low inferior images of the lipomyelomeningocele. So you can see that um, spinal cord and spinal elements are too low. They're, you know, at the level of L4, and then they end up extending dorsally through a dysraphism of the um, lower lumbar spine and sacrum into this fatty subcutaneous mass. And so the mass it shows echogenic fat, uh, neural elements, and CSF in there, and it's skin covered, so it's all a lipomyelomeningocele. And then this is our corresponding sagittal um, T1 weighted MRI that just shows. Um, again, the low position of the cord, it, really there's no even discrete, discrete conus, but everything's too low. It's fetal elongation of the cord that all extends through this uh, skin-covered uh, dysraphic defect into a fatty, fatty mass also containing neural elements and CSF. And I think this is my last case, but just to show uh, an example of caudal regression syndrome. So it uh, cl classically is described in diabetic mothers, and they... Um, have uh, abnormal formation of their sacrum, so there's variable degrees of sacral dysgenesis, sacral agenesis, and then they have 
also various findings in their um, spinal canal. So they can have just like a low conus with phyolipoma and core tethering, or they can have this also other um, classic appearance of a blunted um, spinal cord. And in this case, the spinal, um, the conus is low in position, but one thing to keep in mind if like you're looking at an, uh, an MRI is that in cases of caudal regression syndrome, it can be normal position, but just you have to look for that um, normal tapering because um, you shouldn't be swayed by the fact that it's a normal position. If it's blunted, it's abnormal, it's missing, it never formed. And um, so in this case, the um, ultrasound shows that the conus is the level of the inferior L4, and then it's abnormally blunted. It's not tapered. Their MRI um, shows that, again, the blunted conus, they're missing their conus, and then also I think better demonstrated is, is um, fatty thickening of the phylum. And then you can see they only have, you know, a few sacral elements. So this is all uh, compatible with caudal regression syndrome. So, um, I've just hopefully covered some basics of hip ultrasound, spine ultrasound in children, and hopefully it's been a refresher from what you learned uh, in, in residency. <laughs>